series. I'm getting better at saying that mouthful uh, each week. Uh, we're so thrilled today to have John Fensterwald uh, from EdSource joining us. And so thank you, John. We're going to look forward to your expertise on this very important post-election landscape for education. Uh, I'm Tasha Davenport. I'm CEO of CASBO. Uh, Sarah Baches, our Chief Governmental Relations Officer, is also joining us, as always. And uh, just a few logistics as we get going. Um, first, the Q&A is open. The, the text chat, the chat has been uh, disabled. So put your questions in Q&A. Uh, we'll be answering those at the end. Sarah will be facilitating and moderating the conversation around those questions. Also know that questions that we don't get to, Sarah and team have done a great job of getting answers to those. We continue to update and post those resources on the CASBA website. Um, but again, such an important topic. We're going to jump in and hear about the outcomes and the implications relating to uh, the, 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 the election results. We have also posted in the Q&A a podcast that John and a couple of other experts in the field uh, did for us just about two days ago, three days ago. So you've got the podcast, you've got this wonderful resource. And uh, with no further ado, I'm turning it over to you, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And the way we'll begin this conversation, we'll first take it to the state level. We'll, we'll focus a little bit on, and we know there's a few things that are still too close to call, but there were about there were 12 state initiatives and a few do impact education. And so I wanted to take uh, just a quick uh, walk there of what did it mean this year in terms of all of these initiatives that either raises taxes and provides additional resources to schools, restores and reinstates affirmative action. Uh, there is an initiative to allow 17 year olds to be allowed to vote as well as data privacy. So I'll take it over to the initiatives that passed. And my first question to John is, we saw 15.5 million votes cast uh, this year. We know that's an increase and it was to be expected, but we also saw um, a lot of uh, interesting uh, votes that were taken in terms of initiatives that were supported by the business side and business interests. And so here we see Proposition 22 to allow gig drivers the opportunity to be exempt from specific labor laws. Uh, and that's something we've been monitoring because AB5 affects schools. Uh, do you think that seeing how it's, it's looking now that voters did side with um, business interests, uh, and I wonder if it has to do with the economy, what's your take on this uh, potential implication? Um, it, it could be, I think voters probably empathize with at least the ads that showed people wanting to earn some money on the outside. Um, I don't know, I, this might be a unique situation. Uh, if someone else has $200 million that they would like to invest in ads the way Uber and Lyft, I'm sure they would have a good chance. Uh, short of that, I just don't know. And then we also saw that uh, Proposition 24 to expand data privacy is also look to pass clearly. On the fail, although I should have called it too close to, uh, to count on Proposition 15, I did update it this morning that 48.3% are supporting Proposition 15. Uh, so it seems like the battle over Proposition 13 uh, from 1978 is still very much alive. There was so much interest and, and, and we saw a lot of um, campaigns funding coming into this and at the, towards the end of the season. Um, and I know that people are still waiting, as you mentioned, how many more votes are we still waiting to get counted? Uh, 2.7 million, the last report that I saw, that's a lot of votes still outstanding. And you said you might think it offsets because of the regions? Yeah, so I looked at it and it, the result of 48.3 support really hasn't changed from election night. In fact, it dipped to 48.1, you know, if you're following every other hour. And now it's back to 48.3, which is where it was. And if you look at the votes that are outstanding, I would say uh, you look at the counties where uh, it's been doing well, LA, Alameda, Santa Clara, 
Uh, and then you look at the count, the counties that uh, have voted no. It, traditionally, it's um, conservative, more conservative, Central Valley, Kern, San Bernardino, Fresno, uh, San Diego. It pretty much offsets each other. Those are just a rough total. So, you know, I, I would, it's hard to predict, of course, but that doesn't look good for the yes folks. Do you think that there's any insights on why voters didn't come out stronger on this initiative on Proposition 15 and then on Proposition 16. Yeah. I know a lot of education entities were supporting this measure, um, but any intel on why you think voters may not have shown up on these two particular initiatives? Yeah, um, well, as you, as you mentioned, they did show up <laughs> for sure. I, and I think that, uh, you, you know, one, one can look at it a couple different ways. One can say this is Prop 13, sacrosanct Prop 13, the first voter challenge of it, and it did pretty well, 48%. In fact, um, it on the polls all along for the last several months, it's it, for a long time, actually, it's been verging 49, 51, close, not the kind of uh, ideally you want to go into an election with, but it's been an impressive coalition that they put together and the amount of money that they put together was pretty much parity going into this. You would think that, that uh, the business roundtable and real estate interests would have swamped the yes, but it didn't turn out. CTA put a lot of money. Chan Zuckerberg found the uh, uh, put uh, foundation put some money into it as well. So in the end, though, um, the business interests really put in a lot of money towards the end. So uh, and you saw a lot of ads, and I think they were in the end persuasive, or at least created doubt. And you know the truism is when you create doubt, you vote no. So I think that's where we're at. Um, but. Uh, and, and they were, you know, persuasive ads in terms of, you know, questioning whether or not small businesses would be affected. Some of the ads, both sides were misleading. They said, well, this would be a $900 tax on every family, which it wouldn't be. And, and the yes folks were saying um, this would bring relief immediately for schools, which it wouldn't because it would be phased in over years. So, of course, you have to read EdSource <laughs> to, to find out what is actually with the uh, proposition. And uh, we don't reach 30 million yet. Um, but I don't know what it says long term. I, I think that I think it's possible to build a coalition, perhaps if if they raise the uh, exemption on small businesses, maybe put in more money for schools. It would have a better chance package with something else. Yes, and in this initiative, 60 percent went towards local governments and 40 percent towards schools. So it wasn't really an education like Proposition 30 when exactly. Governor Brown supported in 2012. And speaking of which, you know, Governor Newsom nominally supported, but he did not campaign for this the way that Governor Brown did for Proposition 30. Who knows what difference it might have made, but it certainly would have might have helped that 1%. Well, and then turning now to the races on the Assembly and the Senate, I did want to let uh, our viewers know that there were some really um, contested seats uh, on both the, the, the assembly and the Senate side to, to keep an eye on. And these are ones just to highlight in various areas in Stockton, San Jose. Uh, the one that caught my interest is District 25. We now have the youngest assembly member, Alex Lee, 25 years old, has a lot of work experience in uh, Senate and assembly district offices and ran without any corporate support and has mentioned that one of his first bills would be uh, no longer allowing races to have to be funded by corporations. So he has experience and it's really interesting to see where another young and now it's Generation C, no longer the Millennial Caucus. And then I, I on Assembly uh, District 57, Ian Calderon stepped down this year, stating that he wanted to spend more time with his family. And now it seems his mom has succeeded in attaining 60% of the votes in the LA region. Lisa Calderon will now take over. And that has been a dynasty. The Calderons have been here for decades uh, with Chuck and Charles. Um, and, and so it's interesting that she won that race uh, clearly heavily. Um, LA is a very political place. 
And one that caught my attention was District 72 uh, with Janet Gwynn returning. She was a former senator and lost her reelection a few years ago. And so she was able to retain the stronghold in that district. Um, so these are different compensations of people uh, that are going to be coming into this um, legislative session. And what I wanted to ask John before going into the Senate is, what do you think this new legislative class will experience and face when they return to Sacramento? You know, what are the uh, what are the big issues that they will face? Well, certainly for education, um, uh, I, I think the impact of COVID uh, will be dominant, and I think you're seeing some very, some interest by the legislature to uh, by legislative leaders to get more of an active role of the state. Um, have the governor certainly that nine. Superintendents of the nine large districts wrote the governor uh, a letter and saying, we want you to take a stronger role and, and assembly leaders uh, wrote the head of, of public health and said, we want more consistent data. We want better testing. So I think they're feeling the. Maybe ill time, because as we head towards perhaps a third wave, or maybe uh, what Dr. Fauci says, the continuation of the first wave of COVID. Um, and maybe we've missed that opportunity to do more for for school now and who knows what's going to happen. But nonetheless, I do think that they will want more data, more testing and more of a clarity from from the state as to when uh, when students should return to school. And then on the Senate side, we're seeing that maybe two senators are going to lose their seats uh, in District 29. Uh, that belongs to Senator uh, Ling Ling Chang. And right now she's falling short. Uh, Josh Newman is, uh, is trailing with 51.5 votes um, in support. And then Senator Morlock in District 37 um, is falling behind Dave Min who has uh, gotten 51.2% of the support. And so the, we know the results won't be certified until December 11th of this year, um, but, but it seems like the Senate will potentially gain more Democratic uh, members in their caucus. Uh, and so it will be interesting to also take a look of the shakeup if there's any changes in leadership or any changes in terms of what's the focus when they returned. We know that the Senate has been a more centrist uh, position, uh, more moderate in terms of looking at the whole picture, uh, but they've been having uh, informational hearings and really focused on distance learning and what's been going on with education. So it'll really be interesting to see this new class come in and see what they want to um, tackle and how they stand up um, to an administration that has been taking a lot of the leadership during this environment of COVID. One thing's clear is there will be a supermajority in both houses, uh, which uh, Senator, which the president elect Biden wishes he had. So. I know there's two races on the Senate side, right? That are still. And I, th I think in the Senate side in Georgia that are still too close to call. Right. That would make a 50 50 tie. And then the vice president would uh, Vice President Harris. It's a nice uh, sound, isn't it? Uh, would be the one who would cast the tie for the stimulus vote. So we can only uh, see what happens. We can only see what happens on the school bond side. We did want to begin by. We can't believe March, what happened in March. Um, we all supported Proposition 13, that infamous number, but it was a $15 billion state bond for both K through 12 and higher education, which did not attain the necessary support from the voters. And so looking forward, we know that a lot of school districts um, became hesitant looking into the general election and seeing if they wanted to continue pursuing their own local measures. What we saw then this time around is that uh, 48 have passed, totaling $12.2 billion out of $13 billion that were being sought in local bond measures. And, uh, and updated from John, 12 of the 14 parcel taxes have been updated what do you think resonated with voters, John, uh, to see this type of turnout and support for school uh, local measures? Yeah, it was an impressive rebound from March for sure. But of course, 
keep in mind, there were fewer bonds for a presidential election. So I think many districts looked at that and said, eh, I'm not so sure we, this would be a good time. But those who were, were uh, intrepid enough to put it on the ballot did quite well. And um, I think that in perhaps in some cases, I don't know en enough about many individual bonds, but I think that voters were aware that uh, the, the pandemic has made folks aware that you do need to repair your schools. You need ventilation systems. Uh, working in an order, and if you, if it's a space problem, that's a factor in bringing kids back to school. So that may bode, bode well for those districts who can present the facts to their districts and saying, look, we have air systems that don't work. It's unhealthy. It's always been unhealthy, but now we have an additional reason to go in and, and fix them. And you know, maybe this maybe this bodes well for a state bond as well, particularly if, as in Prop 13, there would have been money set aside for uh, taking care of lead and water. That was a specific set aside. And if if the uh, state said we want to do the same thing with with uh, preparations to deal with schools with a pandemic, particularly again, um, HVAC systems, that this will be a set amount that might uh, voters might like that. At least it, they identify why it's imperative that they uh, fix their schools. And you're correct. A uh, third, the total number of school bonds. This this. Uh, in this ballot was a third of what we normally see in a general election. And also it was half the amount that we would normally see. So clearly a lot of school districts pulled back, um, maybe from seeing that the, the state bond that would have required their matching funds to be drawn down didn't pass. And so you're right, these are conversations that are beginning to take um, place of should we start looking for a 2022? And should we start building the momentum for a 2022 state bond campaign? We did have support from Governor Newsom. I'm just wondering if, again, with the news of what we were finding out two weeks prior to March 3rd, uh, when we started hearing reports of COVID, if people were thinking about the economic implications and then seeing where we're at now that schools still need uh, resources we, we right. hope to be back physically. We haven't left. Now, we don't know if there will be a, a, a tax proposal on the back in 22 either. That might complicate things. But uh, keep in mind for back when Prop 13, that was the unfortunate. As you know, I think that had a fact when the association of 13, at least the school services think that really was a factor in, in the defeat of Prop 13. But um, that uh, would have been, um, that was a progressive approach. and and low income districts or low property wealth districts would have gotten an extra additional money from uh, from the bond. And I think that that's important. And the UC Berkeley um, uh, Center for Cities and Schools did an analysis of the current bonds, and they said it really was weighted towards wealthier districts. So if you were to float a bond, that might be one other element that would be important to many voters in the state. Hmm. That's Good to know. And then moving on to the federal stage, because we know uh, when October 15 passed and we didn't see, see uh, any federal stimulus kick in, that then triggered the cash deferrals for education beginning in February. Now that we've gotten the updated results that there will be a new administration, what's your outlook in a federal relief package? Should do you believe that one would be coming sooner than um, than the new administration on boards, or is this something that we could see at the beginning of next year? Well, I you know I keep yeah I don't uh, I keep reading as everyone else does about uh, what's going on in Washington with great puzzlement, and uh, I hear that there may be an effort to do a, uh, a stimulus in before the uh, President Biden takes over. But, you know, with uh, Donald Trump refusing to even acknowledge <laughs> that there will be a President Biden and all this chaos, and I don't know the prospects of anything coming out of Washington before the next administration. But certainly, we talked uh, about maybe a divided Congress, and so I think a lot of it depends on, on Senate Leader Mitch McConnell, what kind of position he's going to take relative to President Biden, whether it's going to be an effort to compromise. And there certainly were disagreements between um, Nancy Pelosi and, uh, and, the, and the House and the Senate as to where that money was going to go and the priorities. Certainly, President-elect Biden has said very clearly 
that money would there would be more money for schools, uh, particularly and and uh, so I, I think there's going to be a lot of that will be negotiated. I think on the, it would be we can rely on a bigger stimulus, more money for schools, more money, particularly for COVID uh, in the first days of the administration. I think he's aware of it. Uh, I think he's aware of the plight of schools, wants to get schools open, and also recognizes that they need more money in, um, in some of the things we just talked about, ventilation as well as uh, PPE and other things, and also uh, help for teachers. So uh, I, I think we should be optimistic there will be relief on the way. I think it might be some difficult negotiations. We'll see. And then EdSource just released an article that Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond has stepped down from being considered to be the next Secretary of Education. Can you let us know um, j just your thoughts in terms of uh, she is involved in the transition plan with the Biden administration. Uh, what have been her top issues that she has cared about and that we have seen um, in her um, deliberation with Governor Newsom? Yeah, I guess with Linda Darling Hammond's decision, it's sort of California's gain, Washington's loss, you know, one way or another, we will benefit from having her around. And it's interesting. And if I think she, if you go back to the January budget of uh, Governor Newsom, Gus, it seems like decades ago, doesn't it? It's just like fairyland. And what he wanted to do with this year, pre-COVID, two months later, there was a lot of money for to deal with teacher shortages. And you could see, in fact, he thanked uh, Linda Darling Hammond in his mm -hmm. in his um, first uh, press conference for helping mold that there was like a billion dollars for between teacher education uh, and dealing with the teacher shortages, particularly residencies, teacher residencies. Um, uh, and I think that that's going to be reflected. I would be surprised if that's not reflected in a Biden budget as well. So and and community schools that was a big priority. Schools in which you have community supports and deal with medical issues and social emotional learning and and having uh, nonprofits from the community working with the school that's always been something she's focused on and i and that's what would have been in brown's budget and a lot of focus on dealing with the really intense high poverty schools for school improvement which would a little bit different from the approach that we would have taken under the dashboard just said concentrate money a uh, lots of money on these particular schools so it was a really different approach and uh maybe uh, we'll get back to that if the economy recovers but i think that will be her impact when we get back to the normal whatever the normal is and i think maybe you may see some of that coming out in the transition proposals for education out of washington Yes, and so for viewers who might not know who Dr. Linda Darling Hammond is, she's the president of the State Board of Education, and she really is the right hand when it comes to education policy for Governor Newsom. So it's really exciting to see California at the table in these deliberations and these discussions. She's an expert. She has experience in this manner. She was part of the um, Obama administration transition plan in 2008. So uh, really right. exciting to see uh, someone who has been, um, who understands California very well, also understands the direction we're going and leading that. Um, so it, I feel like it puts California again, it keeps us on the map and keeps us um, at the forefront of these key um, areas. And, and one other thing, Sarah, it, I think it means that uh, you will have between Mike Kirst, uh, also retired professor from Stanford, as, as well as Linda Darling Hammond is uh, emeritus professor from Stanford. You will have, uh, assuming a second, Newsom, not to jump the gun on that, but it would be 16 years of consistent leadership in creating a vision for California schools. And that's really unusual um, when you look at the state of education in states and how political and how much change there is. That would be a 16 year period to develop a, a real clear vision centered around um, local control funding formula dashboard and, and I think probably changing in the way that Governor Newsom plans to modify that. So nonetheless, it's consistent in terms of the approach, which is uh, I, I, whether or not you agree, it's very consistent and important to get a clear vision out there for California. And then I think, again, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond understands the fiscal situation that California schools find themselves. Um, I don't know how many other states do the cash deferral mechanism 
and tried, you know, to do a different approach of uh, providing relief with this trigger should the federal stimulus not have taken effect in the fall. And she knows that very well. So as I think of, of what the outcomes will be moving forward in a new administration, her being part of those conversations and knowing where schools find themselves. I think that's very important for us in our outlook in conversations of future stimulus that include relief for both the state, but also education systems. Yeah, and you mentioned what uh, legislators will be paying attention to when they get back. And for sure, the LAO November report on the outlook of the budget is going to be critical this year. We've seen this odd situation where revenue is way ahead of projections, like $9 billion. So when you think that's great, but it, I will be interested to see what the LAO, I think it's going to, that, that's not going to continue for the year and probably in the years ahead. Uh, they're looking at a six-year recovery, the uh, fi Department of Finance. So there's a lot of noise in the projections and it will be really important. And that's what I think a lot of attention will be on. You're correct, John. I, I don't know if Tasha wants to do a quick plug for what's taking place next week, but we do have an event where we'll have the LAO. Sure. With that, I'll jump in. We have our CBO symposium next week. We're expect, expecting about 400 of our state's uh, chief business officials, and uh, we are going to be hitting that topic very hard on what those implications forecasts are. You know, as you said, $9 billion ahead, but we've got a big $11 billion deferral ticket out there. So what's the timing sequence and how are we going to of course, manage the, the resources that we do have. So thank you, Sarah, for allowing me that shameless plug for our CBO symposium next week. Caswell all the way. And with that, I wanted to turn it over to anyone on our audience uh, who had any questions. You're more than welcome to raise your hand. There's a little hand feature that allows you to speak. We would love to hear your voice directly. It's much more engaging in this virtual world. Uh, both John and I are extroverts, so we, you know, we enjoy that. And then you're more than welcome to type up your question in the Q&A box um, for us to, to look at and to discuss. One thing as we let people look at the Q&A, think through their questions. John, have you heard anything from the Biden administration on their plans for reopening schools? Um, not really in terms of that, except that the awareness that there needs to be a stronger federal role in terms of setting and encouraging it and setting the standards for um, setting standards for testing and making sure that there is testing and a recognition that schools need help in reopening. I think you're going to see something fairly soon on that. And it seems like we will start seeing who the transition, um, the cabinet is made up. Um, it seems like they're working really quickly so that people start recognizing who those individuals will be as part of his team. It seems like it will be partisan. He's been talking about making sure that there's that recognition. Well, certainly the names that are thrown out there, but he was uh, President Biden had a lot of support from teachers unions and you see Randy Weingarten of the AFT being suggested, uh, Lily Eskelson Garcia, former president of NEA among those. And then you see some um, big city mayors of uh, Baltimore and Chicago and Philadelphia being thrown out there. I, the Senate, uh, President elect Biden has said, I want a teacher. That's one prerequisite for the next Secretary of Education. Um, and so you can, out of those, those all have been teachers. And actually, Tony Thurman's name has surfaced as well. So, uh, you know, you know, nice to see a local guy doing well. Um, so we don't know who's going to be, and we don't know whether it's just being floated around. But I think uh, it'll be an interesting choice and very, very different from the current, current Secretary of Education. In fact, Maybe the emphasis on I want a teacher there is uh, says something in itself. And his wife has been a, a longtime educator, so he touts that as as keeping him honest when it comes to education policy. Yeah, Joe Biden, Joe Biden will play a big role, I think, in education. Thank you froze for a little bit, John. Oh, I did. <laughs> we didn't hear the last part. Oh, I'm sorry. I rarely. 
I really freeze. Um, so, so Jill Biden will play a big role in education in in, uh, in the administration. And those who you may remember, Martha Cantor, who was the uh, uh, president of Foothill De Anza in in California, and went on to do to the Obama administration. Actually, is a good friend of of Jill Biden. So mm -hmm. there is that California connection. And then we've gotten a question. Uh, by jo Joni, uh, I recently heard that Proposition 13 is still the third realm that we can't touch. If Proposition 15 dies, is this proof in your opinion, John? Uh, I think I think 48 uh, percent, a lot of people walking on that third rail. And I don't I think that there was an effective campaign against it. But again, I mentioned that um, it was a big it was a split role, right? Just commercial. Um, Properties would have been affected, although I think the no campaign made a, you know that implication that you're you're next, folks. Your homeowners are next. But I think that there is um, uh, and the yes folks made this an uh, made this a tax fairness issue. So I think that there may be some receptivity. I don't think that, uh, and there's a whole generation. Remember, this is 40 years ago, and this is a much more progressive, younger generation who don't have that same feeling about Prop 13. At the same time, if they're going to be uh, homeowners, they don't want fast rising taxes as well. So I think the commercial properties is where the target will be still. Do you think that there maybe was a little bit of overload and saturation? There was 12 initiatives. There were various local um, ballot measures as well. Here in Sacramento, we saw multiple. You had local races, state races, congressional positions, and then a, a presidential election, which we know that typically generates more activity. But were people feeling a little burnt out of and overwhelmed? Yeah, I think people were feeling overwhelmed for lots of reasons for the past six months. And the uh, presidential election certainly dominated everyone's thinking. And, and then, you know, there's no mystery not all propositions are created equal in terms of the ability to get out the message now prop 15 was the second most expensive um ones you you may have thought you saw a lot of uh, kidney dialysis ads but actually in it was uh prop 15 was next to prop 22 the most expensive so i don't think it was a message in that case i think it was um i i think it was just hard to to get around the no the vote no, the no ads that appeared there were a lot of no ads so I think people understood at least had a perception that they understood what it was about uh, and now Prop 16 was a different matter there was very little money and, and it was a real no identifiable spokesperson for the yes on 16 and I think that made a huge difference in the outcome so um, the, the contrast between 15 and 16 in terms of the amount of money and um, the publicity is is contrasting for sure. And then it, Proposition 15 was a grassroots campaign. They were gearing up in 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 style of walking, engaging communities, and in a COVID environment, you couldn't do that anymore. Where you can knock on doors and actually have that interaction with uh, potential voters, um, so that engagement clearly changed. That's an interesting point, Sarah, because uh, the 15 folks were really counting on that face to face, go to BART stations, hand out pamphlets, and that didn't happen. So uh, they had to pivot, and I think that hurt the campaign. But nonetheless, it was, they've been organizing, the folks, the uh, Community Coalition and the SON 15 have been organizing for this for several years. You have to say it was an impressive effort on their part that was uh, hindered by COVID. And they did make modifications early on this year to recognize some of the opposition they had received from small businesses. They upped um, the commercial property to $3 million. Um, right. But again, I think in this COVID-19 environment where we see a, a high unemployment numbers, businesses closing left and right, I'm sure just this, that stark reality with what they were receiving as um, information on the opposition side Right. I, th I think that folks who were out of work identified with ads that said, I'm a small business person, I'm struggling now. These uh, increases in taxes will show up in my rent. And I think that was hard case to overcome. 
I just find the whole state initiative process to be a little bit overwhelming as an advocate who works in Sacramento and DC dealing with legislation that at least goes through policy processes. <laughs> well, it's true. It is overwhelming. It's an Ed Source uh, Employment Act. So uh, <laughs> not that we like that, but uh, there's a lot to write about every other year. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at this point, we haven't seen any additional questions, and so we recognize that people are preparing for board meetings, and it's it's been very interesting um, just watching what has taken place. Clearly, again, 2020 is just a different year altogether, um, but John, I truly appreciate your time. I truly appreciate your efforts and in, in, in really being an ally and supporting our organization and always reaching out. As you heard our members in the podcast mentioned that um, we wake up reading EdSource. And so if those that are still logged on are not waking up eating, reading EdSource, it's a great uh, way to figure out what the top issues are of the day here in Sacramento. We truly uh, appreciate that. Uh, thank you. I've enjoyed it uh, much. Uh, it's edsource.org. And we also have a podcast this week in California Education, which usually goes up uh, every Friday night. And uh, and if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get notification on Saturday morning. So uh, anyway, I've enjoyed being here. Thank you for asking me. Perfect. Well, with that, we'll wrap it up. As always, we invite our, our guests and our members to email us directly. Tasha can be found at Tasha at casbo.org and myself at sbatches at casbo.org for any additional questions. Thank you so much for your time, John.